Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so today we've got a taster lecture on counterfeit drugs. I'm very pleased to introduce um, Dr. Amira Gerges as our speaker today. Um, Amira is the program director to our brand new exciting pharmacy degree, which will be starting this September, and she'll be delivering the session today. So over to you, Amira. Thank you, Cecilia. So. Uh, as Cecilia said, I am Dr. Amira Gerges and I am the MFARM program director. And um, I believe I met many of you uh, already. Uh, so today we are gonna talk about counterfeit drugs. So hopefully by the end of this session, you will have um, a, a fair idea about the types of fake drugs. You will understand what is the supply chain. You will, uh, we, I will share with you uh, one of the detection methods for counterfeit drugs. And we are gonna talk about the role of pharmacists in tackling the issues around uh, fake and counterfeit medicines. So we need to understand what are counterfeit drugs. Um, basically counterfeit drugs, they can threaten the whole health system and they don't only put a risk um, uh, uh, on the lives and health of millions of patients who believe that their prescription medicines are genuine, safe and effective, but they also uh, pose, um, you know, uh, a great cost on the pharmaceutical industry uh, in lost revenues. And they, uh, they expose these companies to a range of reputational and liability risks. So before we talk about counterfeit drugs, let me just explain something about drugs or medicines in general. So let's say I'm, I'm just going to show you a tablet. I've, I've got something here. Basically, let's say this is a tablet here. I don't know if you can see it uh, from the virtual background. That's fine. So basically, a tablet, what does it contain? Normally, it contains uh, one or more active ingredient, which is the ingredient that has a therapeutic effect that can be used to manage the symptoms of a disease, for example. But the rest of the ingredients can be binders or fillers and basically things to put uh, the tablet together to make it compact, to make it not bitter and so on. So therefore we understand when we talk about fake tablets or substandard drugs or counterfeit, we will understand now what these mean. So substandard means the active ingredient, which is the ingredient that has a therapeutic effect, actually is the amount of this active ingredient is actually lower than as stated. And these can be pharmaceutical products that do not meet the quality standards and specifications. So the active ingredient is there, but not to the amount that's required. Fake drugs means they have no active ingredients at all. So they, they may look the same, but they may have no active ingredients at all. Counterfeit is normally a word that's used interchangeably with falsified drugs. And in this case, the active ingredients have been changed or replaced by another substance. And the WHO or the World Health Organization actually defined counterfeit or falsified drugs as medicines that were deliberately or fraudulently mislabeled uh, with respect to their identity or their source. So basically they may look very similar to the, to the original drug, but uh, they may have been fraudulently or deliberately changed and therefore the active ingredient in them have been changed. Uh, spurious drugs are basically uh, imitation drugs. Uh, and the, the most uh, popular one that we've seen a lot is the Viagra uh, tablet or the Viagra tablet. Basically, they, they are um, an imitation of the original product. And um, they are imitated in a way that looks extremely genuine and therefore hiding the true identity of the product and making it to resemble another drug, especially if it's very uh, if it's a very popular brand. Uh, and why do they do that? Because they want to deceive the buyers and cash on the popularity of the original drug. And in these cases, the product may or may not contain the active ingredient. 
So what are the types of drugs that can be produced as fake drugs or counterfeit drugs? They can be any drug. They can be prescription or over-the-counter medicines. They can be branded products. They can be expensive drugs that people are not able to get hold of, like cancer drugs. They can be prohibited or unauthorized drugs like benzodiazepines, for example, which are restricted uh, uh, under the law, uh, they can be market dependent. And this means it depends on the market where they are popular. So if we think, for example, of the US, you will see that people put a lot of, you know, thinking about weight loss drugs. So it's very likely to find a lot of counterfeit or fake drugs that are presented as uh, weight loss drugs. If you look at in some African countries, countries where they may not have access, for example, to antibiotics or anti-malarials, you will see a lot of fake anti-malarials uh, in those countries. You may also see uh, counterfeit drugs of, uh, with drugs that have a potential uh, for misuse, like morphine analogs, for example. Health food supplements is a big topic, and I'm going to mention about it today, but with health food supplements, people buy them as, as medicines that can be uh, not harmful, uh, quite safe, like herbal medicines. And let's remember that with herbal medicines in particular, this can be very tricky because of unclaimed active ingredients in them. Uh, also, counterfeit drugs can include drugs with low restriction and high popularity. So if people are, are you know, um, very uh, interested in some sort of uh, drug you may find a lot of counterfeit of these drugs online, for example, and also medical devices. So can you see this alert on, on the screen? And this is an alert by the counter fraud authority of the NHS uh, warning people about buying the COVID vaccine online. So there were a lot of counterfeit vaccines online, but also we've seen a lot of counterfeit COVID tests as well, and that can fall under medical devices. So we've seen a lot of adulterants or drugs that are unclaimed to be in counterfeit drugs. And these were like steroids, uh, drugs used for erectile dysfunction, um, NSAIDs like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or slimming agents, anti-diabetic agents. So we've seen all sorts of things with counterfeit drugs. What are the main risks associated with fake drugs? Basically, there are two main risks. The first one is therapeutic failure. So if you are taking a drug to uh, manage the symptoms of a disease or to cure a disease, basically, this is not going to happen. So you are going to get complete therapeutic failure. Or on the other hand, you may get patient harm because of uh, the patient is not getting the right dose that they should take, or uh, the patient is getting unclaimed ingredients, which are not mentioned. As you can see from this picture, these are some prescription drugs that have been um, uh, sold, uh, as you can see, on a table in the street somewhere. So you can see how dangerous this can be. So uh, counterfeit or fake drugs, they may uh, uh, contain the wrong ingredient, too little of it, too much of it, or none at all. And this means that patients may not be receiving the therapeutic value they need and may suffer adverse effects because they are getting the wrong uh, ingredients or the wrong amount. And this can be so much like a Russian roulette where you don't know what's in them, especially if you buy them off the street, like in this picture, for example. Um, and for example, in the case of uh, counterfeit antibiotics or counterfeit antimalarials, um, some diseases may develop uh, drug resistance. And if you take the incorrect dose, then you may start to suffer uh, from that. And I'll give you an example. There was a drug uh, called heparin, which is a drug used to prevent drug clots. And um, there were uh, recorded in, in a few years ago uh, in the US, that was not in the UK, uh, there were uh, uh, reports of 81 deaths and 600 allergic reactions from a batch of heparin that was actually counterfeit heparin. So we can understand they can carry and pose a great risk to the public. So where and how they are produced? 
as you can see from this picture, they are not produced in a, <laughs> in a very nice place. So they can actually be produced in ordinary households or small cottage industries or even under the shade of a tree. And they can be produced in some of the most deplorable and unsanitary conditions imaginable. So it's no surprise that you may sort, you may find all sorts of uh, contaminants in those uh, drugs. So as you can see from this picture, this is a picture of counterfeit drug manufacturing site in China, uh, which produced fake Viagra and other drugs that were sold to customers in Europe and in the US. In this picture here, you can see a counterfeit cough syrup that is being dispensed from a water cooler in Pakistan. So these are real pictures related to real cases of counterfeit uh, drug production. And in this picture here, you can see used vials and bottles that were seized during a raid in Colombia, and they were washed for reuse uh, to hold counterfeit medication. So you can imagine the, the, the risks associated with this practice. So basically, we need to know that counterfeit drugs, they are produced in two main ways, deceptive and non-deceptive. In the deceptive type, the consumer cannot recognize the counterfeit products by just by visual inspection um, because they are perfectly uh, made as the original product. And in order to identify and confirm that they are counterfeit, you need to do an evaluation test to identify what the product is. Basically, you take a sample of the drug and you take it to the lab and try to identify what it is. But you cannot identify the true content simply by visual inspection because the product looks so like perfect, like the original drug. In the non-deceptive type, the consumer can easily recognize that this is a counterfeit product because you can see the tablet, it's, you know, um, it's disintegrating, it's got non-uniform colors, uh, it's showing clear poor compression mechanisms, and it's got poor labeling on the pack. But in recent years, we started to see a rise in accessibility to counterfeit and fake drugs. But why is that? That's because they can be, they can be technically produced anywhere. They, the majority of these counterfeit drugs are largely manufactured by unregulated markets in some countries. And this can be a very profitable business uh, associated with high demand. So people wanting that drug, unable to access it through the doctors. Um, it's, it hasn't got a very high production cost. So the costs are so small and it's very easily transported from one place to another and basically very low risk because there is hardly any legislation in those markets. So where they can be sold? Basically, they can be sold anywhere. They can be sold on the street, on the internet, and they can be found through legitimate supply chains and I mean by that pharmacies. And now you are gonna say like, oh, how, how come we can find counterfeit drugs in pharmacies? So, and this is all have emerged because of increasingly complex global supply chains where basically with the rise of the internet pharmacies and advancement in technologies, which made it very easy for criminals to produce and sell counterfeit drugs. So I will focus on the internet and then I will talk about the supply chain. So let's look at the internet. Of course, with the internet, you've got the good, the bad and the ugly. And the good, basically the internet has definitely increased access to products in general, but also to medicines in particular. I'm not gonna talk about the good. I'm gonna focus about the bad and the ugly. And I'm gonna just show you examples from practice where we can see this and where in the end our role as pharmacists to reduce harm to patients. 
So this is an example of cognitive enhancers, or as they are known, smart drugs. So smart drugs have been recently been uh, like really popular among uh, pilots, heart surgeons, uh, novelists, astronauts, students, soldiers. So like really professional people trying to um, buy those smart drugs to be smart <laughs> and to for different reasons. So for example, students were using these drugs thinking that they can stay awake for many days and this can improve their ability to study. And many studies actually have found a very high use among com students uh, from competitive courses. And uh, the online sale of cognitive enhancers was predicted to reach around 8.3 billion pounds by 2025, which is just in four years. So you can see that this market is actually very popular. And on the right hand side, you will see uh, a screenshot from Twitter, basically uh, some website from India selling uh, nootropics, which is the other word to cognitive enhancers. There is a debate whether cognitive enhancers are actually harmful or not. In fact, the, there is work that Swansea University has published many, about two weeks ago on smart drugs talking about the harms associated with uh, uh, cognitive enhancers, especially if they are bought uh, and used by healthy individuals. So individuals who don't have cognitive decline uh, or diagnosed cognitive decline. So this is quite a uh, it's, it's a debatable uh, topic, but however, definitely there is evidence of harm from using those drugs, harms with uh, uh, dependence, with developing addictive behaviors and physical and mental health harms as well. The bad, now I'm talking about CBD oil and CBD oil actually before the pandemic has become like so popular, which is known as cannabidiol, which is a component that's not psychoactive and found in cannabis. So CBD oil was the latest fashion, and I always called it the wonder drug. People were marketing um, CBD oil on the internet and on the high street shops because it's completely legal to sell it. And they were saying it's for pain, it's for epilepsy, it's for sleeping. It helps with this, with that. It helps with everything. And such thing does not exist. And you guys, when you will start to learn about pharmacy and study pharmacy, you will understand that such wonder drug does not exist. There is no drug that works for everything. So this is a screenshot from a real online pharmacy. I'm telling you, this is from a real online pharmacy. And I just started to point out in red all the issues associated with uh, marketing, which is completely inaccurate and basically tricking the customers and making sure that the customers are going to buy more of it. So the first thing is they are saying this product product contains no THC. THC is the psychoactive component in cannabis and it is known as tetrahydrocannabidiol. THC is restricted by law in the UK. However, I can tell you for sure from the work I'm doing and from the work I've been involved with, there is no technology to date to um, completely isolate CBD and from THC. So basically, even though these products may contain mainly CBD, they will still contain traces of THC, which is the potentially harmful compound or component. Uh, also, this uh, website also shows that the products have been tested when this is not true. So they are implying it's efficacious, it's effective, uh, the content is completely known, um, and basically they are given more information that are not fully accurate. Also, they are given a lot of indications and by law, you cannot give indications or say what the drug or, or the medicine or the product is used for unless this is a medicine. So you cannot say you can use it for anxiety or you can use it for pain or you can use it for, use it for muscle disorders because now you are breaking the law because you can only say that for medicines, not for health food products. This is another um, 
other examples on opioids. And here I call it the ugly because opioids are actually very high risk drugs. They can use, they can cause respiratory depression and they can kill patients. So here I am showing you a number of uh, examples of opioids and benzodiazepines, which have uh, been accessed through the internet and they were mainly counterfeit drugs. Okay, so as you can see here on my left hand side, uh, this is called the Xanax bar. So you can see here tablets that have been completely produced spuriously. So spurious drugs, so they look exactly the same or very similar to the real drug. But what did they contain? As you can see here from the information I got you from drug seizures by the police, in the first batch, alprazolam, diclazepam, and caffeine were found. Which, is, which means three active ingredients which can have detrimental impact on your body if you take them. The second batch contained etizolam and etizolam is a type of benzodiazepine that has caused a lot of death across Europe over the last few years, in fact. Diclazepam is a novel psychoactive substance, uh, a benzodiazepine analog. And the fourth batch was completely fake, means no API, means no active pharmaceutical ingredient. The pictures in the middle actually are showing you a real drug seizure uh, of uh, clonazepam, which was sold uh, online and the other, uh, the, the figure on the right actually is about codeine phosphate, which is a true pharmaceutical, which was sold uh, via, a pharmaceutical, uh, via a pharmacy online without asking patients the correct um, questions before actually supplying a high risk drug like codeine phosphate. And when we say without asking the right questions, means if there is easy accessibility that open the route for criminals to take advantage and to introduce counterfeit down the line uh, in those supply chains. The other thing I wanted to drag you uh, to take your attention to is the website and how professionally could look like. Here they are actually given peer advice. So they are saying, oh, I bought it from this website and it was, oh, it was awesome. It was the true drug. It was not counterfeit. It was correct. You see what I mean? So here they are given peer advice. Do you actually, when you need advice on medicines, where do you go? You go to your pharmacy, right? You speak to the pharmacist and you say, my friend told me to use that drug. Shall I use it? Shall I buy it online? Shall I do? Or ultimately you talk to your GP. But the first point of contact is you walk into your community pharmacy on the high street and you ask questions to the pharmacist. But unfortunately with these uh, criminal activities, they produce these, you know, peer advice and customer reviews so that people can actually feel confident when they buy these drugs. This is another online pharmacy. It's a Canadian pharmacy. And you can see they are convincing the customers to buy tramadol, which is again, very harmful if you wanna buy without a prescription. They are saying, oh, we are offering you competitive prices. You can even buy online, you, you know, use your credit card. Um, uh, you, you are gonna get the, the batch, you know, like fairly quickly by post. And they are giving customer reviews. They are saying rating on the bottom left side, 98 out of 100 based, you know, on, 22,000 ratings, people said like it's, it's a top product. But here, this is a completely fake internet page. As you can see, the person, the picture here, it shows that it's offline, so it's not even online. And they are giving themselves enough time to take the money from your bank account, but not deliver at all. And then when you go to say, okay, I didn't receive the product, you don't find the website whatsoever. And that's why here they are giving you a time frame of 30 days by the time you uh, get the product by post. So 30 days is a long time for them to have taken the money, closed down the website, and that's it, and you lost your money. And this is actually a documentary based on an undercover operation that was actually broadcasted by Sky News last Monday. 
And this was on buying diazepam online and buying benzodiazepines in general. And you, I actually encourage you to go and watch it because it's actually quite, uh, it's very interesting to see how this um, underground criminal activities actually uh, are carried in basically selling more and more of those sleeping and anxiety drugs. All right, so I told you we are gonna talk about the internet. Now we are gonna talk about the supply chain and how counterfeit drugs can end up in a completely legitimate pharmacy. So the sub, what is the supply chain? Basically the supply chain is the journey of the drug from the point of production to the point it reaches the customer or ourselves. So the problem of counterfeit drug of course has been made worse because of complex global supply uh, chain networks. And as you know, a lot of the medicines that we take today are made overseas. And this means that the risk of adulteration of count or counterfeiting is quite high. So the fact that these drugs are imported into our country, it means that the, there is a very high risk of these drugs being mishandled, adulterated, counterfeited be, before they even enter the country. And as you can see from this picture here, illicit producers come into that supply chain somehow, whether this starts at the country of origin where the raw material were, you know, assembled and put together to produce the drug. And this process can happen in many countries because you may get the raw material, let's say from China, then they, they travel to India to be uh, produced in some UK labs present, for example, in India. And then um, uh, they can be transited in somewhere in Europe, and then they can be sold to retailers or legitimate retailers or wholesalers. And then they, they arrive at the pharmacy sites and then they are given to consumers, whether the, they are drugs that you buy online, sorry, um, over the counter, or drugs that you get on prescription. And th this is where the falsified medicine directive was introduced, which is a legislation across all Europe to identify uh, where the drug has gone from one place to another, from point A to point B, and basically monitor the originality of the drug or its components at every step until it reaches our pharmacy. Unfortunately, after Brexit, uh, this falsified medicine directive is not anymore valid in the UK. And I believe that the UK over the next few months or so are gonna develop their own system. So now let me share with you Operation Singapore. And Operation Singapore is a true, um, uh, operation and uh, it has uh, basically um, it's one of the biggest and the most serious known cases of counterfeit medicines that have penetrated the European supply chain and as you can see the products look like genuine they look like real medicinal uh, you know pharmaceutical products and in that case uh, this was a case that was uh, managed and um, by the MHRA, uh, which is the Medicines and Healthcare Product uh, uh, um, Regulatory Agency in the UK. In that uh, case, the drugs were mainly manufactured in the Far East, and uh, they used a lot of complex global supply uh, chains and money laundering routes. So I will show you here, you can see that the flow of the counterfeit products, they went from Tianjin to Singapore, and then from Singapore to Belgium, and from Belgium, they ended up in the UK. And here you can see the flow of money, which was completely a different route, basically from China to Mauritius to Luxembourg to uh, UK. So it was quite complex. And in this case, um, basically, uh, they managed to seize 2.1 million doses. At the time, the retail value for this seizure was about 5 million pounds. And um, it, was, it was horrible because some of the batches had to be recalled from hospitals and from patients. 
and they included drugs that are used for uh, cancer, for prostate cancer. Uh, they included drugs that are used for uh, secondary prevention of cardiovascular uh, diseases. And basically it was, it was a big, big operation. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about what are we gonna do about this? We have the online dilemma, we have the uh, complex global supply chain dilemma, and let's talk about detection now. How are we going to identify whether this drug is counterfeit or not? How are we gonna do that? So in general, you, you have the visual inspection method, you have the physical inspection method, and you have the chemical inspection method. Okay, and there is a big database in the UK that we use, it's called Tic Tac, where we can look at, for example, round white tablets. We can see all sorts of one white round tablets and we can make it like a physical inspection, look at the dimensions of the tablet and we can try to identify it. But from my explanation that I told you before about falsified and counterfeit, it becomes very difficult to identify what the product actually contains if we only use visual and physical inspections. Actually, we have to go through chemical inspection at some point. And there are lots and lots of methods to do chemical inspection. So we can use wet methods and we can use dry methods. Wet methods is basically take the sample to the lab, crush it, you know, add some diluents and put it into some equipment and do some chromatography techniques, for example, and identify what are the con uh, components present in those tablets. So basically that process is lengthy, is costly, and you need a lot of uh, experts to deal with it because not anybody who works in a lab can actually deal with that. But there, is, there are methods that are non-destructive and non-destructive means you can basically still use the sample in the court if basically this was a seizure and you want to make a case against those gangsters. And one of those methods is called Raman spectroscopy. Raman is really nice and is something I really like and I have used in the past because it's got two versions of it. A version that's in the lab and a version that's handheld that you can take in the pharmacy or you can take in the hospital or you can take basically use in at border control or um, by the police or uh, uh, at the airports. So the top pictures, the three top ones are for the uh, hand, uh, sorry, the bench top equipment that I used to have in my lab. And as you can see, it's got a casing and inside that casing, you can actually put the powder or a tablet, as you can see under the microscope, and you can actually look through it and you can actually make identification of what this is. And the handheld is exactly the same, but is much quicker. Is it has less resolution? Do you know when you have a good camera and an old, and a and a and a bad camera? If we think about our old mobile phones, maybe you guys uh, did not ex have that experience because you are used to the most up to date, uh, you know. Um, mobile phones, but you can see all the latest mobile phones, they have like really brilliant cameras, like can be scary about the very high resolution uh, versus, you know, the older phones. So this equipment is exactly the same because you take it into the field, you kind of miniaturize all the com content of that equipment and therefore you lose a bit of the resolution. So it's not the greatest, but it's better than nothing. Okay, so I'm going to show you how it works. So basically, this equipment or this technique that's used by that equipment is kind of a science that's called spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is basically um, uh, measures the interaction between radiation and matter. So you shine a laser onto something, let's say a drug, and you get a signal and that signal is a fingerprint that identifies this compound. As you can see, the fingerprints are shown here on my right hand side, blue and red. Blue is Raman, is called Raman scattering and it is basically the opposite or the complementary to IR, which is infrared. Okay, just to give you a bit of 
background on what is ramen. It relates to someone who was called ramen. <laughs> uh, so that's actually true. And uh, basically it goes back to 1800 where Lord Riley discovered something called elastic light scattering. Basically interaction between light and matter where you get elastic light scattering. So when light interacts with matter, it scatters. And when it scatters, it's elastic. Elastic means it's got the same wavelength as the laser source. Okay, or as the radiation source. Then in 1923, Smeckel, who was a student at the time, discovered the inelastic scattering. And inelastic scattering is when the light interacts with matter, but in that case, the scattering is not elastic anymore. It's not the same wavelength as the radiation. It's actually a different wavelength from the radiation. Then, in 1928, Raman basically was traveling on a boat and realized that actually the scattering here, he was able to identify the inelastic scattering and prove it in practice by identifying that the blue color of the sea is actually not because the water is blue, but this is the scattering of the sunlight by water molecules. And that's why we see the sea as blue. And that was basically the basic of this. But Raman didn't go anywhere because we needed very high intensity light. And only lasers were discovered in 1960. So after the first lasers were discovered, we were able to take this and put them into Raman instruments and use them in practice. So it's a fairly new technique. And this is just a picture showing you that you need to shine the laser at any substance. And if the substance is Raman active, you get that inelastic scattering and you are able to identify it. So this is another picture, again, showing you how we identify it in real life. So as you can see, we had a counterfeit tablet at the bottom. So as you can see, the, the lower fingerprint or signal, and we compare that to what we actually found in this sample. And what you look for is basically, I'm gonna try and use my stylus here. Basically what you do is you look at the peaks at the same position and the position is called ramen shift, okay? So if you see the peak for cocaine, for example, is present in the cocaine fingerprint, it's not present in the phenacetine or the pain reliever fingerprint. And it is present, but very weak in the unknown tablet. We actually was able to identify that the unknown tablet contained cocaine, but also contained phenacetine by looking at where the peaks are from the fingerprint. All right, and this is the equipment um, the top one, actually, this is an equipment that I used in my research, and it's beautiful because you can actually test all material that you want through their packaging, so you don't even need to touch them. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a technician actually trying to identify that the raw material used in the production of some tablets is the true type of raw material. You can see also um, trying to identify the liquid, so it can identify solids and liquids through the bottle. And you can see from the picture below that you can identify the content of the tablet through the blister pack. So you don't even need to bring the tablets out of the blister pack. Raman has also a very nice uh, functionality when it comes to counterfeit. When you guys are going to start on the pharmacy degree, you are going to produce tablets, you are going to produce pharmaceutical products, and you are going to understand the importance of having uh, homogeneity in mixing. So if a doctor tells you, you need to take half of that tablet, so the patient would use a tablet cutter and would cut it in half, but the patient is fairly confident that the right half contains exactly the same content as the left half. But as you can see from the top left picture, you can see that the content is actually focused or, or concentrated in some areas of this tablet. And therefore, this is a counterfeit tablet because it's not homogeneous enough. And Raman, we can use Raman mapping where we can get a cross-sectional map 
of the tablet and we can look for homogeneity of compounds or ingredients in that tablet. So this is a real case, by the way. This picture is from a real case. All right, another important thing for ramen is basically it's non-destructive, as I told you, so we can use the samples in the court if we want to put the criminals in prison. Uh, you identify them through packaging, and I wanted to bring this to your attention. Can you see anything in the vial below? You can put in the chat for me if you can see anything. Can you see anything? I'm trying to see if anyone has reply. Oh, so you said no, you cannot see anything. Well done. I can assure you that there is something in that vial. There is only one powder particle of a drug called carfentanil. And carfentanil is a drug that's used to sedate elephants. And that drug basically was mixed with heroin. And you can see this is heroin seizure on the bottom right side. So this drug is so potent to the extent that it can actually go through your skin if you touch it. So therefore, ramen can become very handy in here because you can basically try to identify the content through the vial. But I just wanted to tell you a, a small story about this particular seizure, which happened in 2017. Basically, when the police raided that place for heroin, I mean, they didn't know that there are drugs mixed with the heroin. Um, they started to see a lot of people in that place already fainting and suffering from respiratory depression. And when the police started to do CPR on those people who were actually going into cardiac arrest and they were going to die, the police officers started to feel that they are unable to breathe because they touched the sweat from those people who were already dying. And in fact, they started to see the police dogs fainting as well. So that tells you how strong the carfentanil was. And because of what happened there, I mean, some people said it didn't happen and it's the media trying to, you know, ex expand and exaggerate on the real story. But that caused that all police officers which were going into similar raids refusing to give CPR and to give first aid to those people who are dying from this type of drugs. And that shows you the big issue around these drugs when they can become so potent and so strong and can be extremely harmful. Going back to ramen, as I said, you point and shoot at the sample and you get that fingerprint on the right hand side, which closely connects to the chemical structure of the product. The good news is, Water is a very weak scatterer, so if you have a sample that's in liquid form, it doesn't actually mask your signal. We'll show you quickly how to interpret the results. So as you can see, the, each color on, these, on this uh, chemical structure relate to a particular position on the signal or on the fingerprint. So for example, the CHs would always come in this region, which is 1200 to 1400 and so on. It's like a puzzle. You start to say, okay, we've got CH, is it CH or CH2 or CH3? Uh, have we got a double bond? So a carbonyl group, so double bond uh, O and so on. And you start to bring this puzzle together until you say, we may have this compound in this tablet. And this is actually a picture showing you uh, how we were doing, uh, or not me, but this, these people in, in the link below, basically uh, looking at amorphous and crystalline raw material used in pharmaceutical industry. And basically, when you are in the pharmaceutical industry, you understand the difference. You cannot use one or the other. You need to use the right type of powders. Otherwise, when you take the drug and it goes into your body, it may have a completely different effect or harmful effect. And the equipment would give you a pass or fail based on the right type that you recorded on your uh, instrument. If you are unable to really identify the instrument, there are lots of tables that are published that you can find even on Google where you can go and figure out, okay, the C uh, bromine actually is always found in the 500 to 700 position. Uh, the CCL are always found in this position. And therefore, you are able to identify what these peaks are 
and collect the different functional groups which will form your final structure. So I will show you now a case that BW Tech actually have carried out on a fake, uh, sorry, on a counterfeit, uh, counterfeit batches of anti-malarials. So this is the original drug. The original drugs ha drug has two compounds, lumafantrin and artemether. Lumafantrin is blue, artemether is green. You can see that Lumafantrin has two main peaks, which are here, and th they have this one, which is also identifiable for Lumafantrin, and Artemether actually has this main peak. So let's now look at the seized batches and whether they were counterfeit or not. So this is batch one. Surprisingly, it has showed all two peaks for Lumafantrin. It has showed those ones. Okay, perfect. Let's look at batch two. Actually, batch two was completely either counterfeit or fake, because you can see the peaks are completely not there in the red fingerprint, right? Let's look at batch three. So batch three, the counterfeit is the red one. So can you compare it to the brown and green? So again, you can see that the two drugs are not there. So this is simply how ramen is used in practice. As you can see from the picture on the left, this is exactly how it is. Point and shoot and you get the fingerprints and you compare it to what you expect to see. And this is the work I've done and this is my equipment. So I wanted just to share with you a few things what pharmacists can do in this situation. So this is a study that I've done in 2019 about uh, basically in a substance misuse clinic, we invited all people who are going to use any street drugs or online drugs. And we said, okay, guys, if you are gonna take those drugs, let's identify what's in them and give you some clinical advice. Of course, the main reason here was we wanted to invite them to uh, convince them not to take the drugs at all and to come in treatment if we know that they are addicted to some drugs. But if we found that they were going to take the drugs anyway, regardless of our advice, we started to give them some advice so that they don't uh, go to A&E or die basically. And this study has gained a lot of attention from the media, as you can see, and it was done in collaboration with Adduction, the Substance Misuse Service, and the University of Hertfordshire. And you can see it has contributed to drug policy in the UK. And basically, we have tested so many drugs. And sorry, I don't know. Yes. Oops. Sorry. So these are types of drugs that we tested. So we had some street drugs, which came as herbal material or as powders. We also had colorful tablets that are sold online and basically trying to imply that they are safe drugs. But we also had the Xanax. Remember I showed you Xanax before? And basically they were counterfeit Xanax. They looked exactly the same as the prescription Xanax. And it was just fascinating to see that it was like fake uh, and uh, counterfeit. So including completely other things than what we expect to see in them. And by the way, Xanax is the brand and the prescription Xanax contains a benzodiazepine uh, called Alprazolam. This is some more of, of my work. Basically, this is um, uh, promethazine, which is an antihistamine and codeine linctus. Uh, People are buying them from the pharmacy, but also gangsters are buying them, trying to remove uh, and change the labels on them, making sure that they are not going to be identified and mix them together. And again, we've seen a lot of reports of people suffering from a lot of harm from these uh, mixtures. The other thing, as I explained to you earlier, I was involved in a lot of work relating to food supplements. So the one at the bottom, the green one, uh, was bought by a woman uh, from a herbalist in the UK. The woman suffered severe toxicity to her kidneys, uh, went to A&E. I took the tablets to analyze. And what we found, uh, as you can see, the tablets are poorly made, as you can see. They are like a lump of powders. And these tablets had metformin in them. And metformin is an anti-diabetic drug. Uh, so basically, she bought these uh, to lose weight from a herbalist. As you can see, she was admitted to hospital. The top one actually looked 
basically like like my pearl earring here. Uh, it was silver. Uh, it had this black goo in the middle, which we could not identify, but the silver coating actually was very high in tin, which is a metal, and also had traces of heroin. The other one actually is a nootropic drug uh, and was sold as a food supplement, uh, but was found to contain a drug called tianeptine. All right, so what is the role of the pharmacist and what pharmacists can do in these situations? Uh, basically, we need to work together to maintain and preserve the integrity of the supply chain. We need to ensure there is quality control at every step. And we need to ensure we carry out pharmacovigilance studies, which is monitoring what the drugs are causing to patients, even after they, they use the drugs and after the drug has been on the market for years and years. We need to be able to report to authorities if we see anything, share data together as healthcare professionals, provide first aid because we are trained and you guys are gonna be trained in your pharmacy degrees to, do, to provide first aid from year one. You need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms if someone has taken counterfeit drugs, uh, educate patients that they need to get their medicines from the right sources and raise awareness among the general public that you know, it's not safe to buy medicines online uh, unless it's from a legitimate pharmacy. You need to explain to them how to recognize a pharmacy is actually a legitimate one or not. Um, you need to refer patients who suffered harms from counterfeit medicines to doctors and make sure that you document everything and uh, uh, um, basically tell patients that natural doesn't mean safe. You need to see, you know, CE marks on medical devices. You need to basically look at, make visual inspection if you buy anything online. But if you see, if you need medical help, you need to seek it from a pharmacist or a doctor. So in summary, we've seen what are counterfeit drugs. What is the difference between counterfeit and falsified? We've seen how they can infiltrate the supply chain, and what's our role as pharmacists to basically ensure that patients are gonna be safe. So thank you all, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Mira. Um, so it, it's really interesting and really informative. So I hope you've enjoyed the session today. And um, so before we pause for our final Q&A and um, for everyone that's watching us from the recording, um, if you've got any uh, questions following today, please contact us on study at swansea.ac.uk and we'll be very happy to get back to you.